Uh, good afternoon, sir. Can you see and hear me? Yes, thank you. Uh, Ms. Matthews, can you see and hear me? Yes. Good afternoon. We saw before lunch that um, Mr. Thomas had said that the uh, balances were affected by a series of horizon generated zero lines that Fujitsu were approached and a witness with expertise had said that the sister, system errors within Horizon were capable of generating uh, zero lines and that through an exchange of um, emails and other communications that evidence was edited out of the final statement served by Mr Jenkins. Agreed? Yes. I want to turn to um, how the case was presented in court then, please. Can we start, please, with poll 304485? Um, do you remember these kinds of documents, a summary of facts prepared in accordance with that rule of the Magistrates' Court rules? Yes. And can you remember what the purpose of these summary of facts were? Was. I, I believe it was just to give um, a synopsis of the case to the... Um, I think it went to the prosecuting solicitor who was attending court. I'm not sure if it went to the defence. I don't know. Who um, drew these up? It would have been the criminal law team. And so in this case, it will be Juliet McFarland, is that right? Yes. I think we can see from the foot of the page, if we keep scrolling, that this appears to have been saved in... Um, a member of the criminal law team, Julia McFarlane's um, work folders. Can you see that? And it, do you know whether this was um, served on the court? I don't know. In any event, can we go to page two, please? At the foot of the page. The document has summarised what um, Mr Thomas had said in interview and then says this. Um, there are a number of legitimate reasons why a zero entry might be presented uh, on an online summary. These may be because, one, a customer enters an incorrect PIN number. Two, a customer has no funds in their account over the page. Three, an incorrect PIN number is entered on three separate occasions. Four, the card's been stolen or cancelled. Five, uh, the transaction is unauthorised. Uh, Horizon data showing nil transactions um, have been analysed over a specified period between November 04 and October 05. Fujitsu had no concerns regarding the integrity of the data received from uh, Garwin Post Office. Further, the Horizon system help desk had not been alerted to any hardware problems. Um, can you see that um, at the foot of page two and the top of page three there, the so-called legitimate reasons why a zero entry might um, appear on uh, an online summary is lifted from your uh, report for the purposes of disciplinary proceedings that we looked at this morning? It looks the same, yes. I wasn't sure the legal team actually got the discipline report. I'm not sure, but it does look the same, yes. You remember this morning I said to remember that. Yes. Um, that, that was for now. Um, so they've lifted in the document, uh, we know that this is disclosed to defendants and presented to the court. That's what the magistrate's court rules say. Uh, your summary, your own summary of the five legitimate reasons for a zero entry um, appearing in an online summary. Yes. What we don't see is Mr Jenkins' um, expression in the course of 
the early drafts of his witness statement, the fact that it may be a system error, do we? Yeah. Do you know how that's come about? I don't have any dealings in the presentation of this document or in the drafting of it. We can take the document down, um, please. But what was the process or practice of the communication of information, the like of which we've just seen in the emails just before lunch, from the investigator to the criminal law team? Sorry, in respect of, of what? So we've seen that there were uh, email exchanges. There were at least three iterations of a witness statement from Mr. Jenkins. What was the process for uh, disclosing, communicating that kind of information to the criminal law team? I would have presumed that if them documents would have been um, available to me, I would have disclosed them to the prosecution uh, lawyer, sorry, to the criminal law team. However, I would, do, I would have expected the casework team to have forwarded their documentation onto the criminal law team for consideration. We've seen that in some cases you were in possession of the material because you were a copy on the email chains. On one. I don't even recall looking at that, but there are several more, and I would have I would have expected the casework manager or the management team to have forwarded them on. Why would you expect Mr Ward to forward those to the criminal law team when you were the officer in the case, essentially, the investigator? Because some of them I didn't even have sight of. Well, that's why I'm asking what the process was. Um, w was it the case that somebody like Mr Ward had a duty to dis um, fulfil uh, disclosure obligations himself directly to the criminal law team, or would he provide material back to you? I, I don't know what the process was at that time. I don't think there was any structured process when it came to dealing with Fujitsu because it was a new area. I certainly wasn't aware of what any set procedure would have been in regards to the communication between Fujitsu and the casework team. But I wouldn't have expected it to be documents and statements that I was unaware of. I mean, this, um, the example we're looking at does relate to Fujitsu, but it need not relate to Fujitsu. Mr Ward or another member of the casework team could be having communications with any witness. Yes. What was the process for ensuring that material created in the course of the investigation was collected together by the disclosure officer and passed to the prosecutor? I, I don't recall what the process was. Is that because there wasn't one? I don't think there was. I can't recall ever seeing one whereby what the lines of communication laid down guidelines would be with regards to the casework management team. Does it follow that you can't say that Mr Jenkins' earlier drafts of statements dated the 23rd and 24th of March 2006 were provided to the criminal law team? I, I don't know. Irrespective of the means by which it occurred, do you accept that it was necessary for Mr Thomas and the court to be informed that one of the three main reasons for nil transactions were system faults? Yes. Did you know that the uh, law at the time required a prosecutor, including in that an investigator, to retain 
record and disclose final versions of witness statements where draft versions differed materially from the final version? I presume I would have done yes. So you were aware of the duty to record the existence of such draft statements on an unused material schedule? Yes. Can you help us to whether that occurred in this case or not? I didn't do it because I didn't know of their existence, but anything that happened after my documentation had gone into the criminal law team, and, and it happened on a few other occasions, not with the cases that we're going to talk about today, then the material would be added by the criminal law team onto the um, schedules and then disclosed. You referred, uh, we discussed earlier, your initial analysis of the ARQ data which you said you analysed to look for anomalies and patterns. And I asked you about what training and experience you had in analysing ARQ data to look for anomalies and, and patterns. Did you, when you were undertaking that work, record what you did? There was a document... Um I think there was like a log, but I, I certainly made an entry in my notebook to say what I've done. Uh, would that be I can't, sort of, I can't recall sorry. specific sorry, I can't recall specifically what I did, but it would be recorded what I did, and I, I don't know whether I made it in my notebook or whether it was a word document in terms of what I received and how I did it, I can't recall specifically. And to be fair, I might be getting confused with some analysis work that I did in Royal Mail, so where it was recorded on log, so I can't be specific. Was your analysis served as used evidence? I can't recall, because I can't recall if I did it. And is I, it what, I just can't remember what happened in that, that moment in time as to the ARQ system was quite new when when I asked for it. It wasn't and I'm not sure there was even a set procedure for what to do in the casework management processes. And does it follow that you can't say that the record of your analysis and the results of your analysis was served as unused material as well? I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't know what was served. Uh, can we move on then to um, closer to um, the court appearance? And uh, we've seen the witness statements um, taken from or, or provided by uh, Mr Jenkins. But were you treating him in your own mind at this time, as um, an expert witness? I, I think I was just treating him as a witness to the case. So not as an expert? It, it, was, never, it was never stressed to me he was an expert witness. He was just a witness in the case. What does a witness in the case mean? He was somebody that would be able to give... Um, an account as to what had happened in a particular circumstance and... So a witness of fact, essentially? Yes. Would you have treated him differently if you, in your mind, were treating him as an expert witness? I, d I don't think so, because at that point, my role was one of an administrative to ensure he was aware of the court times, hearings, location, etc. But we've seen um, from the emails we looked at this morning um, that you were copied into a draft statement and an arrangement was made for you to attend at 11 o'clock at Fujitsu's premises to take a witness statement from him. If you um, did attend on the 6th of April 2006 and took a witness statement from him, 
you would need to know in your own mind whether um, you were treating him as an expert witness or not, wouldn't you? I don't even recall taking the witness statement. I know that you said that this morning, but assume that you did for present purposes. Would you agree that you'd have to um, establish in your own mind how you, would, how you were treating him, what his status was? In my mind at the time, I think I, I just had him as a witness. I'm not sure it was specified to me that he was a SME. If he was um, treated by you as an expert, can you help us as to what um, differently you may have done? I, I can't because it didn't. I didn't do that, so I, I can't offer what I would have done differently because I don't recall how he was categorised at the time. Also, I'm not at that time, as I explained earlier. Um, I was being mentored in my role because I was quite new. So, I, I mean, I think that email says to bring somebody else or mentions taking somebody else. I, I don't know whether I did. I don't know whether I went. I can't remember. But I know at that time, the actions that were taken in relation to this case were checked and, you know, put through somebody else, whether that be the second officer or my line manager at the time. And who was your line manager at the time? Paul Dawkins. Uh, can we look at um, when the case um, is in court by looking at FUJ 0015-2616? And look at page three, please. And scroll down. Thank you. This is an email. Um, it's dated the 12th of July, 2006. If we just scroll up a little bit, we'll catch it there. From Mr. Jenkins to you. And he says, Diane, I discussed this with somebody else that the last two weeks in September was the best time to go away on holiday. But since something else, we'll try and arrange for some other time. So there's some discussion about his holiday and leave arrangements. And he said, I understand that uh, also that the trial is in Carnarvon. Uh, do you have any idea as to how much time will be involved and what exactly is required? I've never been to court in any capacity, and my knowledge of such things is based on films and TV, which I'm sure are inaccurate. And then can we see your reply at page two, please? And scroll down. Um, reply at same day. Um, hi, Gareth, thanks for that. Um, first couple of paragraphs are about um, practical arrangements. And then third paragraph, all witnesses will have to be present on the first day unless the defense has agreed their statement and do not wish to ask any questions about that evidence. It's pretty much as you see on the TV, really. But remember that you will have sight of your statement prior to taking the stand and can only be asked questions specifically about your statement. A lot can happen between now and the 25th of September, as Mr. Thomas's defense is still asking a lot of questions, and so we will wait with anticipation. So um, Mr. Uh, Jenkins was um, making it clear to you he'd never been to court before? Yes. And he was asking for your help? Yes. And you told him that going to court is pretty much as you see on the television? That's what I promised on the email, yes. Is that accurate, that what happens in court is like what happens in, on television? Um... Sometimes yes, sometimes no. But there was a conversation um, I had with Mr Ward, I think it was, about 
the fact that Fujitsu is by telephone, Fujitsu people haven't been to court before. So obviously, I don't know whether other arrangements need to be put in place. I don't know whether it was, but it clearly wasn't. Looking back, um, maybe with the benefit of some reflection, do you consider this to be adequate advice? No. For a prosecution witness who had never given oral evidence in court? No. Would you agree that the advice given bears no relation whatsoever to the sort of guidance and advice that ought to be provided to a witness? Yes, that's why I was in communication with the case work team. Do you think that your level of training and understanding was typical of other investigators at that time? I can't speak for other investigators. I was new at this time. Did you alert anyone else in the post office team as to this request for help or guidance by Mr Jenkins? Only the casework management team. I think I would have had a discussion with um, my mentor and my line manager. You tell him you can only be asked questions specifically about your statement. Where did you learn that information from? That's what I was told to write. Told by who? That would have come from probably my team. What does that mean, my team? Either the person mentoring me or my line manager. Did that line, you can only be asked questions specifically about your statement, have anything to do with the fact that what had been expunged from Mr Jenkins' statement was that the Horizon system may have errors that cause the creation of zero lines? No. I don't worry about that stuff that we've cut out. No. You can't be asked about it. No. That's just a bit of casual advice, a bit like going to court is a bit like you see on the television. Is that right? I've explained. That's what I was told to write. Can we move on, please? Um, Fujitsu 0015-2650. Uh, this is an email from you after the court appearance um, to a range of people, including Mr Jenkins and Penny Thomas, Andy Dunks back in Fujitsu, dated the 8th of... Uh, November 2006. Uh, just to let you all know, Mr Thomas was sentenced to nine months in jail on Monday. He was ordered to pay costs and his finances are now subject to further investigation. Thank you for all your help with this case. Mr Thomas was not expecting a custodial sentence and although not a particularly lengthy sentence, it does send out the right message. And you attach a link to a BBC article what was the right message that was being sent out? That was a cut and paste from the, what I was sent by the communications team to refer to. Who um, within the post office was responsible for um, drawing up that um, uh, message? That was the communications team. It's like a media team where, I don't know, the press, et cetera, would go to them for comment, and that's what I was told to put. Why were you um, speaking with the media team, the communications team? They spoke uh, to me. Uh, about the contents of an email being sent internally and to Fujitsu? I think the case was quite high profile. I think it had been on the TV. And that's when the media team, they, they got in touch with me and this was the party line to be told. And that's what I did. I cut and pasted it from their message. So you're just following orders? Yes. Did you share the view that a custodial sentence send out the right message to sub-postmasters? 
not necessarily no. I, I, my view on it was I was not expecting Mr Thomas to get a custodial sentence. Was there often messaging like this by uh, the post office's PR machine? It, was, it wasn't the only time I experienced it. And you were saying you were told to say this, even though you didn't think it personally yourself? That was the message. It didn't, I don't think it really mattered, or I don't think I was even asked what my view on it was. It's, this is just, this is the, this is the response from post, the post office. And can you help us why the communications department would be dictating your, the contents of an email to Fujitsu? I would imagine it's that we, we all give the same message. It's a, a linear approach. I don't know. I don't know what their reasons were at the time, but that's what I was told to follow. Was, uh, were you aware of a sense that it was important to the post office uh, that this case should set a precedent to other sub-postmasters who uh, raised a problem with Horizon? I, I don't know if... My view on it at the time was... Well, I don't know what the reasons were at the time, but I know now, and I probably knew when I was leaving, that there was some lens that were being... Um, gone to to try and protect the system, let's say. Who did you learn that from? That was just my view, because I could see what was happening before I left. What could you see was happening before you left? That people were raising concerns over the system. But what about the response to that? What could you see as, um, in relation it to the response to that? It seemed to be a denial that anything was wrong. And it was like protect at all costs because obviously they're invested. Can we turn to Janet Skinner? That can come down, thank you. In your witness statement, it's paragraph 68, you tell us, Miss Matthews, that you were unhappy that um, Janet Skinner was charged with theft. Yes. You did not think that she had stolen the money and that there was no evidence to prove that she had. Yes? From my recollection, and I have relay, relied heavily on the documentation with this because I didn't recall it at first, but um, I just don't think I could get to the bottom of who had done what in the office. I couldn't prove or disprove Miss, Miss Skinner had or hadn't, and the same with... Um, some of the witnesses, although, you know, the witnesses did give some accounts and, you know, on the balance of probabilities, I couldn't determine who had done what. If we just look at your witness statement, please, at um, page 21, paragraph 68. It's at the foot of the page, page paragraph 68. This is under the heading of um, Janet Skinner. My views in this case have not changed in, I think that's any respect. I was not convinced Miss Skinner had stolen the money and there was no evidence to prove she had. I was therefore unhappy with a theft charge and conveyed this at the time to the um, assisting lawyer. Yes? So it's you didn't think she had, but more importantly, there wasn't any evidence to prove that she had committed the offence of theft. Correct? Right. Yes. You interviewed um, Janet Skinner alongside Mr Bradshaw, didn't you? Yes. Did he, Mr Bradshaw, agree with you that at that stage there was no evidence of theft? I, I don't know. I don't know what Mr Bradshaw thought at the time. Did you discuss it as co-investigators? I would have done, but I can't remember what his views were. Did either of you say to uh, Miss Skinner... We've dealt with people who have stolen money from the post office before, but we know that you haven't stolen the money. I don't recall saying that. 
So she wouldn't have known that you thought that she was innocent of, no, the, because of I, theft? No, because when I spoke to uh, Miss Skinner, um, I did some follow-up statements after that, and it was on the basis of everything put together that I didn't think she'd stolen it. I see. Did you communicate that um, view to Mr Bradshaw? I can't remember. I, I presume I did, but if you want me to say absolutely, I, I can't remember. We, we had conversations about all the cases regularly, so I, I presume I did, but I can't say for sure. When uh, you reached this view, as you say, as a result of investigation, um, that Miss Skinner had not stolen the money or there was no evidence to prove that she had. Did you communicate your view to Miss Skinner then? No. You say that you spoke to the assisting, uh, or conveyed this, uh, to the assisting lawyer. Who was the assisting lawyer? I think it might have been Juliet McFarland. And what did, um, if it was Juliet McFarland, she say? I can't remember, but I remember when I saw the charges, I said I didn't really agree with them. But again, it was a case of she's the legal, um, legally trained person who makes the decision. I don't make them decisions. Did you speak to your line manager about it? He would have known. I'm sorry? He, he would have known because that would have been the communication at the time. I'm not sure if it was still Mr Dawkins or not at that point. We had several managers. Presumably, if you think, um, A, that, that Miss Skinner had not stolen the money, but B, perhaps more importantly, there wasn't ev any evidence to prove that she had, but the lawyer was pressing ahead with a theft charge, that would be quite a significant event, wouldn't it? I can only presume that she thought there was some evidence in there that warranted that charge. Uh, we haven't seen any communications between you and the lawyer over this issue. Was this all done orally? It was a phone call when I got the... Well, I'm, I'm trying to remember correctly. I think it was a phone call that I made to her when I received the charges. Was it just a one phone call? Sorry, notification of the charges. I hadn't received the actual summonses or anything. Um, I think, yeah, I think it was just a one phone call because I said, like, I'm... I'm guessing I said something along the lines of, because I can't remember exactly, that, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't point the finger definitely at one person because there seemed to be a lot of people there and there was... A lot of people have different opportunities and reasons. So, you know, Miss Skinner was adamant she hadn't stolen it and never made any admissions to that, from my recollection. And I was shocked that the theft charge was there. And so presumably when she was sent to prison, leaving behind her two teenage children, you thought that was uh, monstrously unfair? It's never a good thing when people go to prison, I, and I don't take... It's not something I take great pleasure in seeing. Might that be a... Um, contain a whiff of understatement? I wasn't asking you whether well, well, you... I don't, I don't know what your question is, meaning to say leaving the two children behind, because that's very emotive, and I don't like to say No, it's that. a matter of fact. She it's left two, chil two teenage children behind while she went to prison. Yes. It is emotive. You're right. And I'm asking you what your reaction was when she was sent to prison, leaving her two teenage children behind. Please give me an answer. It's not a nice feeling, and she had... As far as I was aware, she, she went to prison for false accounting, not theft. 
but that's never a good thing and I never like it and it's you know I'm sorry it's happened can we look please at poll 0010 6906 And at page 51, please. And if we just scroll down so we can see the entirety of the document, it's a letter from Miss um, Skinner's area intervention manager, Angela Bettison. And scroll up, please. Dated the 12th of December 2005. Um, to Ms. Janet Skinner. It says, Dear Janet, we recently discussed the change in your remuneration uh, to traffic-related pay. This will commence from the 1st of January 2006. The new contract is currently being drawn up and we sent um, to Vicky Harrison, Contracts and Service Manager, to be signed off and you will, of course, receive a copy. This means that all of the hard work you've put into the office in recent weeks will be paid in February's remuneration. Thank you for your continued hard work and help running North Bransholm um, Post Office. This um, is some evidence. Um, it's a couple of months before the audit and interview that um, uh, Miss Skinner was uh, um, a dedicated sub-postmistress working well, doesn't it? I didn't have anything to do with this letter, so I, I don't know, but it, it sounds like they were very grateful and supportive, yes. Would this be the kind of document that ought to be brought to uh, reviewing lawyers' attention so that um, he or she could consider whether a sub-post mistress like this would be likely very shortly thereafter to commit crimes against the post office? I don't know. That will be for the legal team. I don't know whether they would take that into consideration or not. And I know Miss Skinner was highly thought of and was given responsibility for more than one office, and she wouldn't have been given that if she wasn't considered to be a stand-up post mistress. Uh, can we turn to disclosure of other information, please, and look at poll 00, sorry, treble 04, 4673. Um, this is um, instructions and a brief to counsel in the case of um, at the Queen against Janet um, at Skinner. And if we go to the last page, please. In fact, it's not the last page, it's um, page four, please. And scroll down. Uh, they're dated um, December 2006, drawn up, it seems, by Ms. McFarlane and Mr. Taylor, the legal executive. Now, I suspect you don't have any role in the creation of these instructions and brief to counsel, is that right? Oh, yes. And if we go back to page one, please, um, can we see that there's a list of documents that uh, the barrister was sent? If we scroll down a little bit more, um, items 9 and 10 are copies of minutes from you dated the 4th of December 2006 and the 24th of November 2006. And um, as we're going to see, I think that they are, uh, they concern somebody called Wendy Lyle. Do you remember Wendy Lyle? I don't remember um, without being prompted by the documents, but I do recall there was something after, um, further on from the investigation interviews, yes. Um, if we just scroll down under observations, the defendant is a former sub-post mistress. The charges concern the theft of monies from the post office during the course of employment. Then over the page, please. And scroll down, please. Last paragraph on the page. 
counsel is requested to advise on evidence, and in particular whether he considers any additional evidence is required. Council's attention is drawn to the enclosures at 9 and 10 above. They're the two minutes that we've just looked at. Um, and is asked whether a theft charge is still appropriate in all the circumstances. Mrs. Whisker is a temporary sub-postmistress at North Brownsholm who took over the office following Janet Skinner's apprehension. These inquiries have not yet been completed in the case against Mrs. Lyle. Whilst clearly the new information does not fare well with the prosecution case, particularly as Mrs. Moyle was a witness, now on news. This does not necessarily mean that Mrs. Lyle is the only thief at the office. Uh, Council may in any event feel that the papers do reveal a very significant, sophisticated method of false accounting on behalf of the defendant in order to conceal a loss um, for which um, he raised um, little concern with her staff. Um, can we look at um, one of the minutes, please, that's referred to as the enclosure 9 and 10, at poll 3048272. If we scroll to the bottom, please. Uh, just a bit more, please. Uh, we'll see this is one of your two minutes that are referred to in those papers to Council, uh, dated the 24th of November 2006. And then scroll to the top, please. Um, so it's addressed to Juliet McFarlane. As discussed today on the telephone, I'm forwarding the committal papers in respect of Janet Skinner. I've contacted Joanne Whisker, temporary sub-postmistress at North Brandsholm, to ascertain the details surrounding the suspension of Wendy Lyle, who's a witness in the case against Miss Skinner. Uh, this following a loss at the branch of 2,800 odd pounds. Mrs. Whisker, who also owns Chanterlands, sorry, Chanterlands uh, Avenue Post Office, was contacted by a member of staff as they were concerned over the movement of 2,000 pounds between individual stock units. It appears Mrs. Lyle contacted a colleague, Avril, She'd removed £2,000 out of her individual sealed stock unit pouch. She was concerned over running out of cash before the remittance into the branch was received. Mrs Lyle added she would return the cash today, which was her next scheduled day on duty. Uh, Mrs Whisker stated she'd arrived at the branch this morning and spoke with Mrs Lyle. It's unclear if and when the conversation between Mrs Lyle and Avril took place. However, when Mrs Whisker checked Avril's stock unit, it shows a loss of £2,000. There was an issue over a bag of £2 coins, totaling £500. Next uh, paragraph, the situation at the present time is that Mrs Lyle has been suspended from her duties, pending further checks being undertaken by Mrs Whisker. And then at the end, Mrs Whisker has a number of areas to check and verify information. She's to keep me informed throughout this process with any relevant finding, which I will relay to yourself. So this is sort of a formal means of communication of information relevant to the case against Mrs Skinner from you to the um, relevant lawyer, is that right? So I missed your answer there. Yes, sorry. Yeah, yeah thank you. And uh, now Wendy Lyle was somebody who you had taken a witness statement from. Yes. Uh, she was a lady that worked in Mrs Skinner's branch. Yes. And she was subsequently arrested for theft. Yes. yes. Now, I think you were the lead investigator in this case by now. We're um, now in late um, 2006. Yes? Yes. Sorry. Can you not hear me? Yes. Yeah. And uh, did that also mean that you were the disclosure officer? Yes, I disclosed things to the criminal law team. And is that how you viewed the duties of a disclosure officer, to disclose things to the criminal law team rather than having a responsibility both to the defendant and to the court to give yeah. disclosure? Yes. And so who would have been responsible for ensuring that information of the kind that we see here was uh, relayed to the defence? That would be the criminal law team. Who would be responsible for ensuring that material like this went on to 
an unused material schedule? That would be the criminal law team and the prosecution support office. So any additional material from what I'd already um, forwarded would be added to or an additional schedule would be done by them to present the cases to the defence. Can we look, please, at poll 3048259? Can we see this is a schedule of non-sensitive, unused material in the case of um, uh, Janet Skinner? And then if we look at the foot of the page, we can see the date of the schedule, uh, 16th of November, 2006. Can you see that? And then if we go to the top, please. It states the disclosure officer believes that the following material, which does not form part of the prosecution case, is not sensitive. And then you signed that at the bottom, didn't you? Presumably, yes. Yeah, if we scroll down, see under where it says GRO, that means general restriction order. We've blacked out your signature. Yes. And so were you responsible for typing documents like this up? Yes. And did you, um, consistently with the answers you gave a moment ago, believe that this was just a means of communication of information to the lawyer as opposed to a declaration, essentially, to the defence and to the court? No, I saw it as a declaration, but it, it always went through the criminal law team because there were occasions where, um, I don't know in this particular case, but I do recall times when um, they would move things around on schedules. So I may have put it as unused, and they moved it onto the use. So sometimes what I'd actually forwarded was not exactly the same as what was disclosed. Maybe the other way as well. Maybe some things I've put as unused, they would see as evidence. So you were responsible for typing these up. Um, the reviewing lawyer would look at them and sometimes move things from used to unused, from unused to used, or from uh, non-sensitive to sensitive? I, I don't know about the sensitive part, because I don't really recall too much being on them, if anything, okay. but certainly between the used and unused, yes, because they, they obviously cast their legal eye upon it, of which I'm not legally trained, and they consider things differently. In any event, take it from me that the material relating to Wendy Lyle isn't on this schedule. OK. OK? I don't want to run through it all, but it, but it isn't. Um, can we move forward in time to see what happened then? Poll 3048292. Um, this is a letter of the 6th of December from... Uh, Julian McFarland to um, you and the post office investigation team. Can you see that? And um, she says the committal papers have been approved and served on the defence solicitors and she encloses a copy. And then scroll down. I've noted the present position regarding Wendy Lyle and that police inquiries are continuing. This information will need to be disclosed to the defence in due course. Uh, further attempts will need to be um, will need to be reviewed to see whether the charge of theft stands. Apprehension of Mrs. Lyle is not in itself conclusive evidence that she alone was the thief. However, this will depend on the evidence revealed in due course. I have also removed Wendy Lyle's from the statement bundle. This can be placed on the unused. And that's an example of what you were just describing. Yes. Yes. Can we then see what happened when agent solicitors were instructed uh, on the same day, 6th of December, poll 3048303. 
Uh, this is a, um, a letter from Julia McFarlane to um, agency solicitors, uh, Maya Wolf solicitors in Kingston upon Hull. Um, I would first review, uh, refer you to the minutes of the 24th of November 2006 and the 4th of December 2006 from the officer Diane Matthews. We, we've looked at one of those. As I understand it, Mrs. Whisker is the temporary sub postmark mistress at North Bransholm. Police inquiries have not yet been completed. Whilst clearly the new information does not bear well with the prosecution case, particularly as Miss Lyle is the witness, this does not necessarily mean Miss Lyle is the only thief at the office. The papers, in any event, do, do reveal a very sophisticated method of false accounting on behalf of Miss Skinner in order to conceal a loss for which she raised little concern with her staff. Naturally, the above information will need to be disclosed to the defence, uh, although the officers' reports themselves are confidential. So this is a letter of the 6th of December in relation to a committal hearing we can see on the 12th of December 2006. And what Ms McFarlane is saying is that we're not going to reveal this information about Ms Lyle now, we're going to reveal it in due course. Can you see that? Yes. Were you aware of anything like a duty of candour when attending committal proceedings? No. Were you trained on being um, open and transparent to a court at the point of committal hearings, i.e. to reveal information at the point of committal which tended to undermine the prosecution case? No. In any event, so far as we can tell, there was no disclosure of the Lyle information um, at or before the point of committal. Then can we turn to much later during the confiscation proceedings against... Can I just make a comment that I, not, I wasn't aware of that letter? I wasn't copied in. I don't believe I've seen the letter to Maya Wolf. So no, I, I didn't know I didn't know that had been said, but I would have expected them documents to be served. Can we uh, look then at what happened later during the confiscation proceedings? Poll three zeros four double eight one nine. Can we see this is an email of mid-2007 from Juliet McFarlane to you and to others? And she says, Diane, I'm presently dealing with the confiscation proceedings. Uh, the defence would like to know whether Mrs Lyle was prosecuted by the police, question mark, and if so, the details. Could you inquire and get back to me? And then um, poll 3048829. Uh, your reply, no charges were brought against Miss Lyle by Humberside Police. She was interviewed, but there was no evidence to support a prosecution. And then poll 3004, double eight five six. Uh, letter of the 3rd of July 2007 to um, Defence Solicitors, Max Gold Partnership. Scroll down, please. Uh, second paragraph, with regards to your comments raised in paragraph 9, I'm informed by the investigation officer that while Ms Lyle was interviewed by Humberside Police, there was no evidence to support a prosecution. Okay, that can come down, thank you. So we can see the revelation of some information in the course of the confiscation proceedings against Janet Skinner. Can you help us? Uh, was the material about the prosecution or the arrest so the possible prosecution or the arrest of Wendy Lyle revealed to Janet Skinner or her legal team before she was convicted? I, I wouldn't know. That should have been done by the prosecution office or criminal law team. 
that was their responsibility, was it? Yeah, I, I just would have expected them to have done that. What about you compiling a supplemental schedule of unused material? That just wasn't the way it worked. Yes, thank you very much. Those are um, the only questions I ask. I'm um, going to look around the room to see whether there are any other questions. Um, just one set of questions uh, from um, from Mr. Steen. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Sam Steen. I represent a very large group of. Uh, sub-postmasters and mistresses. Um, can I take you please to your statement, which is uh, uh, it's likely to be uh, in front of the document handler, but it's WITN 08330100. And so I'm going to refer you to page 35, paragraph 107. Ms. Matthews, um, paragraph 107, do you have that, page 35? Yes. It's the bottom of that page. And what you say there is this. When I left Poll in 2008, the issue of the Horizon system having bugs and its integrity were just starting to be raised. And you go on to say, I did not become involved in this whilst in Poll and where raised as mitigation in my investigation, I followed the process and raised the issues. OK? Yes. So the date that you have within your statement is potentially an important one for the inquiry to reflect on. Now, you've said in your evidence this afternoon, at I think about 2.05 this afternoon, that the post office was denying that there were issues with the Horizon system your words were that was denial at all costs. Now, can you help us just understand that a little bit more? Um, who was uh, sending out this message, this denial at all, at all costs message? I don't know what person, but I just, um, as time was passing on with some more people blaming, rightly so, the horizon system and saying I'd never heard the words bugs and defects until late, you know, or as I was about to leave. Um, but it seemed when the questions were raised it, it, and that conversations that I, I can re I can't recall who said them, but it was. It won't be the it won't be the horizon system. It's not for Jitsu. It's like, and it's like it was a total denial, and it's just my interpretation that this was done because they were heavily invested in it. It had to work, not just from I, I don't think just from a monetary point of view they were heavily invested. I think also from a reputational point of view they were heavily invested, and I think the fallout to have admit at that point um, they just didn't want to face. That was just my opinion. I knew I knew it was talked about within the team, as in the greater team. Um, I don't have any firm comments made by individuals to, to back what I've just set up, but my feeling at that time was that when these issues were raised, they wanted them to be put to bed. That's just my opinion. Now, the date 2008 um, yeah. and the message that was being sent around by Paul, the denial at all costs message, how close to the date of when you left in 2008 was this occurring? Was that in the months or year before? I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I can't give you a date. I just knew I was getting more and more unhappy working there because of certain things that were happening, and I made a decision to leave because what, of it. 
those certain things were happening? Are they relevant to the purpose of this inquiry, in other words, no, regarding the it, horizon it, system and its issues? No, it was more a personal issue with the head of security at the time. Ms Matthews, when um, considering the question of the way that uh, Paul was denying these issues, can I just um, see if we can probe a little bit further? Your line manager was who at that time? When I left, I think it was somebody called Julian Tubbs. Julian, repeat that, please. Julian Tubbs, but Tubbs. he was only my line manager for a very short period of time. Prior to that, it was Dave Pardo. Right. Now, those two individuals, Mr Tubbs and Mr Pardo, do you think that the message was being sent around, the message of denial at all costs, was sent around by those individuals? Were they communicating that to you? I don't think I, I ever had a proper conversation with Mr Tubbs, and it's not my belief that Mr Pardo made them assumptions. Ms Matthews, the, this particular issue, which is that, the, um, that Paul was uh, denying and was trying to tell its staff members that there, are, uh, that there are no issues with the Horizon system, this has come up with now a number of witnesses before this inquiry. And there appears to be a collective amnesia about this amongst individuals like yourself. In other words, not able to recall who on earth was setting out this message. It, Has it word wasn't... gone around, Miss Matthews, that you should keep shtum about this and keep it quiet? No. It's I've, just I've... a coincidence, is it, that you're one of a number of witnesses that can't seem to remember who sent out the message about keep quiet about the Horizon Systems. That's just a coincidence, is it? I think it's quite unfair to say them things when you're asking me about conversations from a long time ago and I've done my utmost to try and recall and be honest in this situation. It was, it was a feeling amongst people that that's what was happening. It wasn't a conversation that where somebody dictated um, this is the line we're going to take. It wasn't like that, but things were happening more often. And in terms of sub-postmasters saying it was the system and it was getting more and more frequent and that led you to believe, is there something in it? So I, I don't, it, it wasn't a message where you know, we were all brought together or people were told this is what we're going to do. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't that sort of situation. So no further questions. Thank you. Is that it, um, Mr Beer? Yes, it is, sir. Well, thank you very much, Ms Matthews, for giving your witness statement and for answering a good many questions today. I'm grateful to you. Thank you. So we return now at 10 a.m. on Tuesday with Mr. Graham Brander. Yeah, fine. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir.